Would you join me this morning as we pray together as a church? Let's pray. God, Father God, you know our hearts. You know our innermost thoughts. You know us and you trust us, Lord, and so that we can trust you. We can, with vulnerability, hand over our worries to you, Lord, in our lives. The worries of our deepest joys so that in our conversations with you we might know you again more and more every time lord that you treasure us that you love us that you hold us lord that you carry our burdens and weep when we weep that you ne you're never far away from us lord you're always near close to us even as your love extends beyond the farthest reaches of our our world today god hold our yearning to reach greater heights our strides for excellence our determination to do more let the fire burn within us to make us a better to make better choices to make a more excellent way when a significant trouble crosses our paths or even in a relationship lord our ability is to hold steady in you when unforeseen circumstances becomes our hope in you, our dreams, our efforts. Give us your spirit, Lord, your tenderness. Let us rely on you and one another in the body of Christ so, so that we do not need to fix it alone. We do not need to solve this alone, Lord. Let us remember that the weighty troubles of the world are held in your tenderness and the salt of the earth to be the Christ's body at work for the sake of justice and peace in our world today. Let us be the one of the called, one who asks to participate in such weighty work of goodness and mercy in our world today. Even the impossible, Lord, our struggles in our city we see racism, we see hunger, we see a crisis. Let us arise and go. Even the impossible struggles across our world today, we see war, we see climate change, we see people hurting, we see people longing to know you, Lord. Let us arise and go. Let the language of your spirit arise within us so that we can hear your call. Great is the mystery of faith, Lord. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. And so, Lord, as we come here this morning, we want to lift up Doug and Denise. We thank you so much for their ministry in Niger. We thank you for the work that you have established through the people there. We pray for the situation that is arising there. We know this is not from you, Lord. We know this is hurting people. We know this is hurting you. We pray for the people there that are struggling, going through such difficulty. We pray for your peace. Uh, we pray for just your peace amongst just the whole region there, Lord, in Niger. We pray for the leaders that are going through this, deciding what to do, uh, such tension. Uh, we pray for your discernment, for your will, for your grace, for your love and mercy to be upon that nation right now, Lord. We pray. In Jesus' name, that you would just break any bondage, anything that Satan has hold around there. That you just break that, Lord, in the name of Jesus. That the leaders will see that this is not from you. And so, God, we know that you are a God of love. We pray for a peaceful resolution there. Uh, we also pray for also uh, Doug and Denise as they had to reschedule their return there. Um, and sometime in September, Lord, we pray for your guidance to be ahead, your spirit to be ahead of them, that you would help them uh, figure a way, that you would just provide a time when they will head back, that there will be a peaceful resolution, that everything will work out in your timing, Lord. We pray for the workers on the ground as well, for the local people there who are struggling, who are struggling to, to make, I uh, guess, ends meet, to struggle with food especially with the prices there lord and everywhere we pray that you would provide uh, the spiritual necessities 
uh, the, the physical necessities, the emotional as well for them. Before the leaders as well as they work there, continue to minister to the people there as well. Um, we also pray for the coming retreat that's being held in that area as well. In October, we ask that as the IWs come together as a retreat of rest, that this will be an opportunity to rest in you, that they be able to learn and grow and pray and support each other uh, during this retreat coming up in October as well. So we pray for Doug and Nice and their ministry there. May you bless them. Um, may you continue to encourage them. We also pray for uh, Pastor Amanda. She'll be coming to share your word this morning. May you anoint her with your spirit. May you guide her through the mouth that you have given her to speak your words through your words, Lord, through scripture, as she encourages us through missions and how we can uh, be encouraged as a district, as a denomination to, to spur each other on and to, to continue your work as you have commanded us to do in Matthew 28. So may you be with her. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit, O oh God, on all of us here gathered here this morning with all these gifts that you have given us. By your Spirit, make us one body in Christ, one in mission and in ministry to the world. Nourish us in faith, hope, and love, and strengthen us for service, Lord, until we feast with you one day in glory. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you sit down, I want to encourage all of us to, to greet one another and to share God's love with one another this morning. So let's greet each other. Wow, the power of the stage. I thought you guys would still talk and mingle and want to share, but this is great. Thank you for your attention. It is an honor to be here. I love that the lights aren't so bright that I can still see your faces. Thank you for coming to church this morning, for coming and meeting with God. I am excited to share the message that God has put on my heart for your church, for the Summit Community Church. And, um, but first, before we dive in, I want to just introduce myself. All you guys know is that I'm Amanda. Um, but I, am, uh, I serve on our district office team as, uh, I was just given a new title, the Director of Missions Mobilization and New Ventures. Now, what that just means is I am on mission locally and globally. I get to talk with our IWs, and I get to share uh, with them while they come home for their home assignments. I help connect them to churches. I help churches connect to our international workers all over the world. I come and I talk to churches about what it means to be on mission for God. And the new ventures piece of my job is to help create those new expressions of church. And so I like to tell people that I get to be on mission locally and globally. That's my job. With me today is my awesome family. Uh, you'll probably see my kids. We have Ezra, Noah, Arabella, and Isaiah. This is almost like a test. Yes, those are my children. <laughs> Uh, they come with me and they travel with us. Uh, we love to have them. They are, um, somebody referred to them this morning as my own, I have my own roadie. They just come with me wherever we go. It's great. Um, I love that they join us on this grand adventure that God's called us to. 
And my husband, Chris, I'd like to invite him up to the stage as well right now. Uh, Pastor Jerry has also invited Chris to come and share. Chris works with our Alliance National Ministry Center as the director for uh, Envision Canada. And he's going to share a little bit about what that is. <laughs> yes, thanks. I don't so think much. we've ever really shared a stage together before, have we? We have. But like in this capacity, this is great. Not in this capacity, yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Chris, and I have the privilege of serving at the national office as the national coordinator for Envision Canada. Um, and for the past 15 years, I've actually had the privilege of serving in a whole bunch of different ministry contexts. Um, I've been the director of a summer camp. Uh, I've been a youth pastor and even a senior pastor in one of our local alliance churches here, um, actually just out in Oshawa. Um, but in addition to that, I'm also a certified leadership coach. And so I come from these places of having um, kind of excitement of working with a lot of different people. Um, and one of the things is as I look back on all of those roles, I mean, Amanda talks about being on mission both locally and globally. When I look at the things that God has called me to, one of the, the threads that runs through everything I, I've done and my passions and um, has been that I have this desire to support and equip the next generation of leaders, to see them grow and to be on mission as well. And this was what made, the, uh, this passion made it possible for me to transition to, into this role within Envision. Um, because at Envision, we actually exist to engage the next generations. That's who we are. We are a resource of the Alliance Canada that helps our local churches and our districts to identify, equip, and launch next generation leaders. Leaders who innovate, who establish and strengthen communities of faith in Canada and around the world. We want to build up those leaders, those next generation leaders within your church who will lead the church. In fact, we have some, of your, some people from your church who have actually come through many of the Envision things, including Mackenzie Weaver. But we do this, we, we prepare young leaders, we equip them, we launch them by creating and curating unique experiences that develop the skill and the soul of these leaders. These experiences happen both in the global context and here in Canada. And I just wanna highlight three of them that we have going for you right now. And our age focus is, is all the way from high school, kind of up to the upper ends of the 20s, about 28. But primarily we work with 18 to 28 year olds. And some of the experiences we have include Justice Semester. This is one of the ones that we get really excited about. This is a 12-week immersive study experience in Phuket, Thailand. This is a gap semester program for those passionate leaders who are, who are justice seekers, who are wanting to grow and go deeper with Jesus. In fact, Justice Semester is actually, it's one of the prerequisites. If you are interested as a young leader in becoming an international worker, um, if you do this, you actually meet the requirements for the biblical courses um, to go and to serve cross-culturally and internationally within the Alliance. And so it's a great opportunity. It launches every September, um, and so I'd encourage you to come and check it out. We also offer a six- or eight-month internship program in Mexico City. This is an opportunity for you to experience God's global heart. And so through your, disciple, or through your internship, you actually learn and grow as a disciple of Jesus. You partner with the work that God is already doing through our Alliance Ministries in Mexico City, all while discerning what is it that God is calling you to? Where is he calling you to, to be on mission with God, both in Canada or around the world? And then finally, we have what's called the Envision Greenhouse, which is a 12-week mentoring cohort. This is for those young leaders who are, who are just looking for a little bit of extra mentoring. Uh, it has two main components. The first one is that we pair our next generation leaders with experienced Alliance mentors. Mentors who will walk with them through this 12 weeks to one-on-one to, -on -one, to say, hey, what is it that I can do? How can I walk alongside you? How can I support you as you are seeking what God is doing? And in addition to that, the second component is that these leaders join with a cohort of peers for three to four online sessions that focus on relevant teaching and practical exercises that relate to our core competencies. We have five at Envision. Biblical foundation, self-awareness, spiritual awakening, cultural agility, and global leadership. 
And so each year we focus on one of those in particular as we help our leaders grow in those competencies. And for the fall of 2023, we are focusing on spiritual awakening, diving into spiritual disciplines and understanding the role of Holy Spirit in our lives as we seek him, learning how to discern and hear his voice. And so if you're interested in learning any more about any of these experiences or other ways in which you can partner within the work of raising up and equipping our next generation leaders or the ministry of envision i'd love to chat with you after the service but i'm excited to know that this is a church that loves its next generation leaders it's evident Mm -hmm. in the way that you support them and we're just excited to partner with you and so thank you thanks I don't know if Chris mentioned, but he does have a booth set up at the back with lots of little brochures and things. um, So feel free to reach out and chat with him later. So last week, I was out in Calgary. I just got back on Friday. And I was there with our international workers that have just come home for home assignment. I was also there with our future international workers, those that are going to the field for the first time. We do a one week get together, it's a retreat, we learn, we study, we pray together, we worship together. It's a great time of fellowship and hearing so many stories. So I just wanted to share a few stories with you. There's one couple, three kids, and they're heading to a closed access country. That's a country where it is, um, you have to be careful about the way that you speak about Jesus. Um, So they're going to this country, and I overheard one of their little kids, five-year-old James, he said to another kid at the breakfast table, "Um, I don't know where I live right now, but I know that I'm going somewhere, and it might be dangerous. (laughs) He's this little five-year-old telling all the other kids this. When I was talking to uh, the parents about what their greatest strength was going onto the field, they said it was their kids, their kids' faith. These parents knew that their young kids were called to be missionaries, to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ, even before they realized that they were called as well. Another international worker that's home this year from Spain shared with me how she uses art therapy to share Jesus' love with the kids in her Moroccan community that she lives in in northern Spain. Her passion came from meeting God through art and through creation. And she knows that if she met God through art, maybe others can meet God through art. So she's taking her passion and she took it to the field where she gets to tell people about the love of Jesus every day. Another international couple that are home from the Middle East with their three kids shared with me how when they were there, they joined local sports teams in order to have a greater impact in their community and get to know people. Over the last two years, um, this, this mom, this woman, she joined a rec league netball team And they became so good that they moved up into a competitive league where every weekend they would have to travel two to five hours away to go and compete in these netball games. I didn't realize netball was a competitive sport. But they would go and they would play. And during those long car rides, she got to hear their stories. And she got to be the presence of Jesus to them. These are just a few of the stories coming from the field. They just seem like average stories, right? I recently read the World Watch List, and I find it fascinating to read and hear about where believers are dispersed throughout the world and how they are impacting the nations for the cause of Christ. While I was reading this, I recently learned that 22% of the world lives in multi-dimensional poverty. So that's poverty that is more than just poverty of wealth. It is poverty of wealth, poverty of food, poverty of healthcare, poverty of education. 22% of our world lives in multi-dimensional poverty. To put it another way, they live off of $1 
and 90 cents a day. There are over 17,000 people groups in this world, and this number just keeps growing as, as more people groups are discovered. There are over 7,000 unreached people groups. Unreached means they have yet to hear about the gospel, about Jesus. That's 42.3% of people in our world have not heard about the love of Jesus. And to put that into numbers, 42.3% is 3.4 billion people that still have not heard about Jesus. Also in the World Watch list, there are, it lists the 50 most persecuted countries in all of the world. Niger is probably on that list. And we have international workers serving in 16 of those 50 countries all over the world. That means that the Alliance is engaging with these least reached people groups all over the world and sharing the gospel where few or none have heard. And all of this is made possible by our church's giving to the Global Advanced Fund. And I would not be a missions mobilizer if I did not talk about the Global Advanced Fund. This fund helps send our workers into the field, but it also helps support the needs here in Canada so that we can help our missional endeavors and initiatives that are happening in the field whether it's relief development, growing the international church, doing marketplace work, initiatives like the Jaffrey Project, which I'm sure you guys will hear more about this coming fall, um, the Alliance Canada, we are on mission in 33 different countries, making the name of Jesus famous. I'm just gonna say that again. The Alliance Canada, whom you are a part of, is in 33 countries making the name of Jesus famous. So let me say thank you. Thank you for partnering in making Jesus famous. Because of your giving to GAF, Global Advanced Fund, we like our acronyms in the Alliance. Because of your giving, many, many people have heard of the love of Jesus. When Jerry gave me the, um, the sermon series that you guys are in, Encountering God in Missions, all I could think of was, well, missions is encountering God. And really, that sums up my message this morning. When you have had a personal encounter with God, when you have met face to face with his saving grace, when you have been touched by his presence, you cannot help but live your life on mission. You become the incarnational gospel presence everywhere you go and in everything you do. Like the stories we read all throughout the gospel where Jesus comes and heals, sets people free, raises people from the dead, frees people from demonic oppression, and then what happens? They go and they share the good news of their freedom and healing. And in a lot of those stories, it's their lives that become the living presence of Jesus. Like the Samaritan woman in John 4, after meeting Jesus at the well. As a side note, if you've ever watched The Chosen, I encourage you to search up John 4 on The Chosen and watch Jesus' interaction and the depiction that the Chosen gives of Jesus and the woman at the well. It is powerful. He tells her that he has water for her that will never make her thirst again. And he goes on to share that he knows everything about her, all of her past, and yet he still offers her grace and the most beautiful thing about this picture is that she is a Gentile woman. And she is the first person Jesus reveals himself to be the Messiah to. A Gentile woman. And what does she do? 
she runs and tells everybody about this. She runs back to her hometown and she says, come and meet the man who told me everything I have ever done. She had an encounter with Jesus. Her life was changed. Peter and John in Acts 4, after the gift of the Holy Spirit has been given to them, they set out to continue the work that God had um, prepared for them to do, the work that Jesus was doing, proclaiming his power and authority in and through them. And at one point before the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin is just a group of the religious elite of the day. They were sitting on a council together. They make judicial decisions, usually against the prophets and the high priests. Peter and John were told by the Sanhedrin to stop talking about Jesus. To which Peter and John, with such courage and boldness, simply said, we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and heard. Is that your answer? When somebody says, why do you talk about Jesus all the time? All throughout the Gospels, we read of people who have encountered Jesus, and from that place of healing, wholeness, and freedom, they cannot help but speak of his goodness, his grace, his kindness, and his love. Their very lives become the incarnational gospel presence wherever they go. One of our dear international workers who served in Burkina Faso and Guinea recently went home to be with her savior. Her funeral last week was live streamed and watched by many people from all over the world. Her impact and devotion to God's call, it knew no limits. She developed radio stations, health clinics, an infant rescue center. She started prison ministries, a women's co-op living, and many other missional endeavors where she could bring hope and compassionate love to Jesus Christ, the compassionate love of Jesus Christ to others. I remember a few years back having dinner with her and thinking, wow, her life is marked by Jesus. She was one who saw so much brokenness in this world, and yet Jesus just radiated from her face because she encountered his hope and his love every day when she met with him. I want to share another story with you about a little girl who knew the power of God and had faith to believe that his power was meant for everyone. She was an unlikely missionary. She was taken from her family and her people and placed in a family where she served. She cleaned, cooked, did laundry. She cared for the family. She was probably rarely seen or ever thanked for what she did, but she did her job faithfully. I imagine that she missed her family, but it was evident that she held to the truth that she was taught because she was a brave little girl who one day decided to talk to her owner and tell him that she knew how he could find healing. You see, he was sick and he was desperate for healing. So she stepped up and boldly told him about a man that she had heard stories about that lived in the next town over and he could heal him. How many of you know what story I'm talking about? Let's open our Bibles, if you have them, or turn on your phones to 2 Kings, verse 5. Sorry, 2 Kings, chapter 5. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. 
she said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went to his master, who was the king, and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, said the king. The story continues. Naaman goes to the prophet Elisha, who tells him to bathe in the Jordan seven times. Naaman thinks that this is ridiculous. The Jordan is muddy, it's dirty, it is not your, thought, your sought after swimming hole, it is not a place you go. But then one of his servant men says to him, bruh, come on. If I knew I was going to get healed just by taking a bath, just go and do it. And so he jumps in seven times and he's healed. All because of this unlikely missionary girl who was away from her family in a foreign land. She was held captive, probably against her will, and had, but she had the courage to speak of the healing power of God's prophets. And I love the fact that she must have had such a testimony among the people with whom she worked that they trusted that the information she shared with them was true. They never questioned her motives. Her life must have been lived as a testimony of God's goodness. She lived as one who knew the power and the authority of the creator to heal and to restore, and she wasn't afraid to proclaim that and to step up and share that, even with her master. But I wonder if you've ever been in a similar situation as this little girl. You are busy at work, doing your worky thing, when a coworker that you've become good friends with comes up to you and shares deeply from their heart of their brokenness, their hurts, their pain, maybe a recent diagnosis, maybe a broken marriage. What is your first reaction? What is the first card you pull out what is your first comment? Is it to complain alongside of them, adding your suffering story as well, just to minimize theirs? Is it to trash talk the health system or belittle the people causing so much pain? Or, like this little servant girl, do you call out to the one who heals? The one who restores, to the one who loves and has sacrificed himself for all of our wholeness and freedom. Do you lead your friend to Jesus? And in doing so, this is where you get to become the incarnational gospel presence of Jesus everywhere you go. You as Christ ambassadors are always on mission. Your words, your actions, your character, your integrity, much like this unlikely missionary girl, you are missionary in all you do. So again, encountering God in missions, missions is encountering God. In the Alliance, we hold to two core pillars, the deeper life and missions. Our founder, A.B. Simpson, he believed that these were two core elements that weren't just important for church, but important for every believer. When we are living in the deeper life, we are going deeper with God and we are discovering new truths. We are inviting Holy Spirit into the depths of our soul to do the good work of bringing freedom and restoration and renewal to us and to others. We learn to hear his voice and we follow his leading. That is the deeper life. And I truly believe that once you have had an encounter with the deep love of the Father, and once you have experienced his freedom and restorative grace, the second pillar, missions, 
It comes naturally. You cannot help but share of what you have seen and heard. Now let me clarify here. When I say missions, I'm not solely referring to an Abrahamic calling to leave your possessions and leave your country and go to a new land. God most certainly is still in the business of calling people to do that. To reach the nations with the love of the Father. But I am also referring to the fact that as the priesthood of believers, that is us. We are called to live in ways that point people towards Jesus. We are called to be on mission, everyone, everywhere, all the time. 1 Peter 2, 9 to 12 reads, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which rage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So whether local or global, all of our lives should reflect the glory of the Lord. This is what Paul was talking about when he wrote to the Corinthians about living with unveiled faces so that we may reflect the Lord's glory every day. I want you to look at that verse again. Did you know that you were chosen? Chosen to be a vessel of God's goodness in this world. Did you know that there is a calling on your life to be an instrument of God, to speak out and proclaim his goodness day and night everywhere you go? Not just on Sunday morning when you come to church, but Monday when you go to work, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday when you hang out at the beach. Everywhere you go, you are called to proclaim his goodness. I had lunch this past week with a dear pastor friend from uh, an Alliance church out in Calgary. She was sharing with me most of her life. We got caught up, uh, but she, she said one phrase that just really stuck with me. She said, you don't need to know the plan that God has for your life, but you do need to know your purpose. I think sometimes we get sucked into having to know the plan and then we forget the purpose. But if we know the purpose, then we can trust that God's plan is good. My purpose, our purpose, 1 Peter 2, 9, to live as one chosen and beloved. Ephesians 2, 6, to live as one seated in the throne room with full access to the authority and the power of the one who God raised from the dead. That same power lives in me, lives in you. My purpose, 1 Peter 3, 15, to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks about the hope I have in Jesus. Ephesians 4, 1, to live a life worthy of the calling that I have received. My purpose, Romans 12, 1 and 2, to offer my life as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. My purpose, John 15, to remain connected to the Father and to his love and to bear much fruit. John 15, 16 says, you did not choose me, but I chose you 
This is Jesus talking to you. I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Ephesians 6, my purpose, to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And as Paul says, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. That's incarnational living. And it seems to me the only way to live out my purpose, our purpose, your purpose, It seems to me the only way to live out our purpose then is in the power and the authority of the resurrection, resurrected Jesus Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit who has been gifted to every believer from God the Father so that we can do the good works that he has prepared for us to do, which is telling people about Jesus, living missional lives, here, there, globally, locally, on mission, declaring his goodness, growing the kingdom, and bringing fame to the name of Jesus so that nations may encounter the presence of God. And just in case it needs to be said, the nations of the world are here. You don't have to go very far to meet someone who looks different thinks different, speaks different. The incarnational gospel presence in you. Encountering God in missions or missions is encountering God. So it seems to me Jesus' mission was just this, that people would encounter his love, his presence and his grace, grace, both Jews and Gentiles. And if that was his mission that was passed down for us, then before we can share his love and presence with our neighbors and the nations, then we first need to encounter his love. Let me say that again, because I feel like there might be an amen coming. We first need to encounter his love. Thank you, thank you. A.W. Tozer wrote, genuine Christian experience must always include an encounter with God himself. Worship leader Jen Johnson wrote, an encounter with God marks you and makes you hungry for more. Are you hungry for more? Timothy Keller wrote, change won't happen through trying harder, but only through encountering the radical grace of God. How have you encountered his radical grace? St. Teresa of Avila, she wrote, one encounter with God is worth a million years of exhaustive theology. Just let that sink in. One encounter with God is worth a million years of exhausted theology. If you have studied anything about St. Teresa, she was kind of a rebel. And she believed that the encounter with the presence of God was the most powerful thing you could ever do. The most powerful piece of treasure you could ever find. An encounter with God. So I'm going to ask you again, have you encountered, have you encountered God? I often think of this question, and I like to challenge people with this question. Can we be a missional movement of churches? Can we be a missional movement of Christ followers if we have not encountered the power of the resurrected Christ. Can we actually be on mission, telling people about the love of the Father? If you have never experienced the love of the Father, you cannot give what you haven't received. I can't teach about rocket science. 
I've never learned about rocket science. But I can teach about the love of the Father because I've experienced the love of the Father. Can we live lives that point people towards Jesus, towards wholeness and freedom, if we ourselves have not experienced it first? I want to speak these words over you, these scriptures. Just want them to sink in. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, also known as the Great Commission. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, and in your going, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And the Great Commission partners very well with the Great Commandment. Matthew 22, 37, 38, and 39, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Summit. Well done, my faithful servants. You have loved the nations well. You have supported missions locally and globally, whether in Cambodia with place of rescue, whether in Niger, in Peru, or even here in your own backyard. You guys just had three weeks of, of summer camp with kids? How incredible is that? Church family, you have served well. You have represented Jesus well. You have sent people into the nations. You have loved your neighbors. But today, my charge to you is personal. It's an opportunity to, to reflect on the ways that you have encountered the love of Jesus Christ so that you can live on mission for him wherever he is calling you to. And in those personal encounters, I want you to ask, how is Jesus calling you to partner with him and engaging in the world around you? What might Jesus be inviting you into as you live out being the incarnational gospel presence in your community? We're just going to take one, two minutes of quiet to reflect on these questions. If you need to jot down what God is revealing to you, if you need to poke your neighbor and say, I think I'm supposed to go to Niger. Do it. I dare you. But just spend some time reflecting on these questions, and I'll close us with prayer. Jesus, we collectively long for more of you, more of your presence. We want to meet with you face to face. We want to encounter your manifest presence here this morning. We want to meet with your love. Jesus, 
Jesus, would you come in power, Holy Spirit, come and fill us that we may have an encounter with you, a fresh filling, Holy Spirit, of your goodness and your grace in our lives. Because we know we can only operate and we can only tell others about you because we have met with you. We need your filling. We need your strength. We need your love. Jesus, for the ways that you are calling us to be missional, whether it's local or whether you're tapping us on the shoulder, to take a look at what it could mean to go overseas and become an international worker. God, we want to serve you. Speak to us. How are you calling us to go deeper? Meet with us, Jesus. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the ways that we have already encountered you. We long for more. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. I'm laying down my life, I'm giving up control, I'm never looking back, I surrender all, I'm living for your glory on the earth. There's passion in my heart, there's stirring in my soul, to see the nations bow, for all the world to know, I'm living for your glory on the earth. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me, light a flame in my soul, for every eye to see. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. This passion in my heart, this stirring in my soul, to see the nations bow, for all the world to know.
burn like a fire in me. Isn't that our prayer? Jesus, we want more of you so that others may know you, so that the nations may know you. If you want to experience more of Jesus, I invite you to come for prayer. There's a prayer team that will be available up here. I'll be available. Pastor Jerry will be here. We'd love to pray a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit's power and fire that we just sang about on you. Today's benediction from Ephesians 3. I pray, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure, filled, filled to overflowing, filled and then spilled for the sake of Jesus. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.